Um, Thank you. Apologies. No worries. Um, hello, everybody out there. Um, my name is David Shanker. I'm a senior fellow, uh, Taub fellow here at the Washington Institute. I'm sitting in today for, for Executive Director Robert Satloff. Um, really pleased uh, for this policy forum um, with a great panel today uh, about Iraq. Um, it is called a strategy for Iraq. And um, what we are doing is having a, a rollout um, of uh, senior fellow uh, Bilal Wahab's uh, transition paper, uh, a transition memo for the new administration or the relatively new administration uh, titled Promoting uh, Sovereignty and Accountability in Iraq. Um, it is a, a significant and provocative piece of work um, that um, uh, I think all Iraq experts should take a look at. And it's, I think, um, uh, quite timely uh, that we are, are having uh, this policy forum today, um, particularly in the, in the aftermath of uh, the, the fire on, uh, on Monday that killed 93 people in a COVID ward in Nasriya, where uh, I think uh, Jane Araf is, um, is right now. Um, this is just three months after the last fire uh, in a hospital. Um, a very similar incident that killed some 82 people in, in Baghdad. Um, we have this in the, in the aftermath and the, the, the environment of, of uh, the people that have been arrested uh, for terrorism charges or beating protesters, killing protesters that are being released. We have people being taken, kidnapped um, with some uh, routinity. Um, and so this all points to the, the importance uh, for a discussion right now about uh, Iraqi sovereignty, about accountability, um, and the trajectory um, of U.S.-Iraqi uh, relations and what the Biden administration should be doing uh, to get Iraq right. Um, and to discuss these issues, we have three, I think, amazing panelists today. Uh, we're really fortunate. We have um, from Nasria, uh, as you said, Jane Haraf, the New York Times Baghdad bureau chief, uh, who's covered Iraq since 1991. Um, she opened CNN's uh, bureau back in Baghdad in, in, in 1998 uh, during the Saddam era. She's reported on the 2003 U.S. invasion, the rise and fall, um, and whatever happens from, from here on of the Islamic State, um, the rise of the Hashid. Um, and everything in between. Um, so we're really lucky to have have Jane with us. Um, I'm really pleased to um, to also um, welcome Joey Hood, uh, the acting Assistant Secretary for Near East Affairs. Um, I worked very closely um, with Joey um, for the 19 months that I was the Assistant Secretary in the administration. Um, and he was the best hire I made in the department. Um, he's well qualified. I can go into all of that he's done, but I'll tell you, he's DCM in Baghdad, a real uh, Iraq specialist. He served as DCM in Kuwait. He was Consul General in Dahran and any number of uh, other senior and junior positions in the State Department, really one of the best and brightest diplomats we have. So great, great to have Joey with us. And finally, um, the Institute's um, Wagner, uh, Wagner Fellow, um, uh, Bilal Waha, uh, who focuses on on governance issues in Iraq. Um, prior to joining the Institute, Bilal was uh, a professor at the University of Iraq in Sulaymaniyah. So uh, I think today we're gonna start off uh, with some remarks by Bilal um, about his paper, some recommendations, um, and then we'll go to, um, to Joey Hood and uh, then finally um, to Jane. So um, thank you all for, for being with us and uh, I'm sure it's gonna be a great panel. Bilal, please. Mute. Yes. Are we good? We're thank good. you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Dave. And I'm very happy to be uh, uh, joining uh, Assistant Secretary of State Joey Hood and uh, uh, New York Times uh, Jane Roth. Um, very briefly, uh, and I'm joining also from from Iraq, where I've had some conversations to. Uh, update some of the um, ideas and recommendations that I have in the paper, or at least to test them with uh, some of the new realities on the ground, because uh, things move so fast here that um, uh, ideas and issues could get dated very quickly. Um, 
the key challenge in this country is a challenge of governance uh, in the eyes of the Iraqi public, uh, issues of services, uh, of accountability uh, are the priority. Things like, you know, ev everyone everywhere, electricity, uh, jobs, uh, healthcare, obviously, in a, in a pandemic year. Uh, and yet the government seems to persistently and consistently uh, fail in these regards. And yet the headlines out of Iraq are not about what matters to the Iraqi people and the Iraqi public, but rather uh, distractions. They are very serious issues uh, as headlines go, but to the priorities of the Iraqi public, they are distractions. And that is uh, rockets here, drone attack there, uh, and then, of course, some of these um, 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 international and regional flare-ups uh, that do make headlines, but at the end of the day, uh, they're not priorities for the Iraqi voters as Iraq has toward the elections, uh, and yet they're forced on the Iraqi public to be made priorities that uh, create an aura, for example, that Iraq is still uh, under occupation, that everything that happens in Iraq is somehow someone else's fault. Uh, everyone trying to avoid uh, and elude accountability. Um, but yet all eyes remain, uh, not all eyes, but many eyes still remain on the United States. Although one thing that I have uh, noticed emerging is a sense of Iraqi agency, uh, that um, they're in it together and perhaps increasingly uh, they're in it alone. And um, Maybe that is uh, depressing when you hear some people voice how alone they are, but at the same time it's being translated into, uh, then this is our problem to fix, which I think is rather new because uh, the, le the multiple international engagements with, uh, with Iraq, all the way from um, toppling the regime, uh, taking care of the Al-Qaeda problem, then leaving, then coming back to take care of the ISIS problem, Maybe the Iraqi political class has a dependency issue. Uh, maybe for the first time, that dependency is, uh, is shifting toward more local agency. Um, from the United States angle, Iraq is not the central issue anymore, uh, but it should not be a distraction either. Uh, Iraq still matters uh, for national security, for economic reasons. ISIS remains a threat. Iran remains uh, a source of instability in the region. Perhaps oil is not a central issue anymore, but it, is, it remains a significant issue as the world energy makes a transition. But at the end of the day, it's also about the opportunity, building stability and an economic opportunity for some 40 million uh, Iraqi citizens and rising. Uh, therefore, stability and, and so a US approach toward Iraq that promotes um, a long-term relationship that is not dependent solely on counterterrorism or on uh, some regional policy that focuses exclusively on Iran requires greater ties and thicker ties between the United States and Iraq. Right now, that relationship increasingly uh, dependent on a single threat of a military and an anti-ISIS mission, uh, but the insecurity, the act of the militias, the regional dynamic, uh, has really narrowed that relationship down to 2,500 soldiers, where they are, do they get attacked, will they leave, will they not leave, what are they doing, how much is the United States committed to keep uh, them in country, and how successful are Iran or the militias to uh, keep them out. And that is really not the kind of relationship that, you know, U.S. or Iraq uh, deserve, or the Iraqi public in this case deserve. The relationship requires to be uh, more beneficial to both peoples, uh, especially in the realms of uh, in the realms of economic exchange, trade, uh, cultural exchange, educational exchange, uh, and this is something that leaders in both countries should uh, aspire for. And uh, some of that is uh, bubbling up as this transition of policy of Iraq being the center of U.S. middle policy in Iraq into something else. That something else could be normalcy, could be a thicker relationship. But at the same time, uh, many uh, in this country voice it as uh, yet another US abandonment of Iraq. And of course, uh, I've heard a ton of analogies being drawn to what's going on in Afghanistan. 
So this is perhaps at times been an endangered relationship, but at the same time, it has been uh, a rather resilient one. Uh, when it comes to the Biden administration, I think uh, Iraq might be lucky that this administration, uh, like the previous administration, in fact, has a cadre of national security and foreign policy experts whose career were built around Iraq. They know Iraq very well. You don't have to explain to the leaders of this administration the alphabet soup or the different uh, names and leaders. Uh, they know the characters, they know many of the issues. Yet despite that, uh, there are some changes that have happened in the past uh, three to five years that is worth uh, noticing and paying perhaps greater attention by the new administration as they come into office. One of them is a shift from a shift of power from political parties to militias. In the past, there were classical political parties some of these political parties had militia armed wings, but now in Iraq, especially since 2018 elections, there are militias with political wings. And these militias are now the leaders, at least of Shia politics, uh, who are the majority in the country and majority in government. So uh, rather than the classical exile political parties that have ruled Iraq, uh, the 2018 election brought to the fore uh, basically two militia groups or two militia leaders who came to the political sphere by starting as militia leaders. And that is um, um, uh, Muqtada al-Sadr from Sayyirun, who leads uh, the Sayyirun coalition, and then Hadi al-Amiri, the chairman of the Badr brigades, uh, who leads the, uh, the Fatah uh, alliance. The patronage politics of Iraq, and of course, the uh, legal framework that uh, the war against ISIS gave to these militias under the umbrella of the PMF has also given these powers, these uh, armed groups, greater leverage in politics. Case in point, look at the uh, uh, 2019 election, and then you compare it to the 2020 and then 2021, uh, I'm sorry, 2019 budget compared to the 2021 budget. This is a pandemic year, uh, and yet the budget allocation for Ministry of Health is reduced by 16%, and yet the budget for the Popular Mobilization Forces, the PMF, is increased by 27%. That tells you at least the leverage uh, that the, uh, um, the, the militias under the arm of the PMF have, have gained politically uh, in the politics of Iraq. I think this is a new phenomenon. Uh, it existed, but it definitely upgraded and evolved into, uh, uh, into a more serious uh, power player rather than a fringe power player. Perhaps another change, which is almost a direct response to point number one, is a, the countering point of rising Iraqi nationalism and the Iraqi agency that I refers to, uh, referred to earlier, uh, which manifests in protest politics, in protest against the state dysfunction and protest against Iran that's increasingly seen as the patron and the protector of uh, the patronage system and the dysfunctional politics. Uh, the Iraqi politics since 2005 has been, all elections have resulted into big 10 governments. It doesn't make any sense in this uh, politics to be an opposition because the name of the game is to gain enough seats, get in government, get a few ministries or government positions, and then siphon off those revenues back into, uh, into those parties and then uh, repeat. And that's why the economic situation is so, uh, so terrible. Uh, that's why the power situation is so terrible. That's why the healthcare uh, is, is in, in such bad shape because uh, the goal and the subject of politics is not public service, but to nurture and nourish those patronage politics uh, that bring them back to power in the four year election cycles. So against this, since there is no opposition, and then uh, since the name of the game uh, doesn't allow for opposition, or whenever there is an opposition that emerges, it's crushed by the powers, the opposition politics have taken to the street. And that's why you had in October 2019, this major protest movement uh, with slogans like, we need a, a homeland, we need a state, uh, which was a clear uh, protest against 
corruption, patronage politics, but also took an anti-Iran bent that is seen as a, as a country, as a neighboring country that is acting as a state, but takes advantage and exploits of the uh, identity affinities of, uh, of Iraq's Shia majority. Perhaps a final shift here is the shift of uh, community politics in Iraq. Uh, looking at Iraq in the past, there were Shia, Sunnis, and Kurds. So there was these identity-based politics. But today, as we head toward um, October elections in 2021, as tenuous as they are, uh, you have two major uh, alignments uh, of one major Shia alliance, one Sunni major, uh, one, one Sunni uh, group, and then one Kurdish group faced with almost parallel with another. So you have these divisions within the confectional communities. Uh, I'm not sure if this is going to lead to having one group being in power and the other being in opposition, but this is also a change of political dynamics that is worth looking at. Now, what does this the analysis and prognosis perhaps, uh, what kind of policy approaches and, and recommendations does lead into? Um, I started by saying that Iraq is not the center of US policy in the region. Uh, Counterterrorism remains uh, important uh, and Iran remains uh, a source of uh, instability and Iraq is caught in between uh, this, uh, this dynamic. Iraqis feel that they're paying the price for games that are larger than them. So on Iran, um, I think Washington should treat Iraq as something beyond an arena for simply pressuring Tehran, but also recognize that any re-engagement, be it directly or be it in Vienna or the nuclear uh, uh, issue, uh, any kind of re-engagement with Tehran must take Iraq's stability into account. Um, perhaps also raising reasonable expectations that uh, Iraq has competitive politics. So elite politics alone, engaging only with the elite is not going to result in the kind of long-term resil resilient relationship, but would require focusing on the people. Um, another point here is, is perhaps a, in terms of reasonable expectations that the United States is unable to fight the militias the same way that it fought ISIS, or it won't be able to fight corruption on behalf of the Iraqi government uh, but that's a task for the Iraqi government, government itself. I think the capacity is there for the Iraqi government to gain uh, the upper hand. It's a matter of political will and it's a matter of uh, regional dynamics. Uh, deterring Iraqi militias should be a US priority, but it should also be uh, made an Iraqi priority. And this is something that I think the Iraqi public also uh, supports. Perhaps another point here um, is the United States by signaling a level of disengagement compared to the recent history uh, could engage more actively in creating the, an incentive structure aimed at uh, ir pressuring Iraq's political elite to have greater investment in Iraq's democracy, Iraq's economy. The Iraqi government has a white paper about economic reform, hold them accountable to that kind of reform, support them to that kind of reform. Uh, there are also older ways of focusing on uh, like a single person or a leader, but I think Iraqi politics is so diffused that focusing on a single position in government would, would, would basically mean pointing on a single point of failure. Um, in terms of economic reforms, um, um, I think that uh, banking reform is very important for this country. There's a lot of cash going around, but there is no banking sector. So entrepreneurs have great ideas but they're unable to contribute to ridding Iraq of the oil curse and opening the market and finding opportunities in the market. In terms of political reform, credible elections are key. Uh, political violence is the main uh, hindrance to uh, Iraq's competitive politics. And then perhaps finally, more in the immediate term, uh, Iraq is in dire need of vaccines. The United States could gain, could win a lot of hearts and minds by providing vaccines to Iraq. Uh, and then finally, maybe just a concluding point here, signaling matters. The sense that I'm getting in this country is that the United States is abandoning us in air quotes. Uh, so signaling some level of commitment, even if it's a different kind of commitment, not the kind of commitment that Iraqis are used to, is very important. That would require some creative thinking on the side of the United States on how to signal to the Iraqi public that Washington is committed to the democracy, to Iraqi stability, and to uh, the prosperity of the uh, Iraqi citizens. Great, well, uh, 
Thank you very much, um, Bilal. I, I think you're saying that you're, you're ending your uh, talk by saying Joey Hood should go to Baghdad. Um, <laughs> but before we turn to Joey, um, let me just remind uh, those out there um, watching that you, if you have a question, you can go to the Q&A function um, on Zoom um, and put it uh, on there and we'll find it. Uh, or if you're watching a live stream, you can go to a policy forum at WashingtonInstitute.org and then send them along there and we'll see that as well. So thank you, Blow. Um, Joey Hood, the Acting Assistant Secretary. Thanks to you, David. And literally thanks to you. Uh, I'm the uh, Acting Assistant Secretary. Uh, so it's great to uh, be here with you. Uh, I, I think you're all frozen. Am I frozen for you as well? You are not frozen. Ah, excellent. Thank you. Uh, well, good to be here with you, David, and of course with Bilal, and Jane knows what a fan I've been of hers uh, for many years. The first time I met her, it was like, um, you know, uh, meeting uh, a fan, meeting a rock star. Uh, and uh, I've, that feeling has never gone away. Um, but uh, in all seriousness, I want to present my condolences to the families and friends of all those who died in the hospital fire in Nasiriya. Uh, may God have mercy on all their souls. Uh, and uh, we should all work together to prevent this sort of thing from happening again. Uh, but thanks again for putting this together. Uh, the last time I participated in a Washington Institute event on Iraq, it was February of 2020, a month after probably the most tumultuous period in U.S.-Iraq relations in many years. It had been um, three months since, uh, since uh, Adil Abdel Mehdi uh, had announced his resignation following outrage over his government's violent response to popular and peaceful protests. The uh, political elite were negotiating uh, hard and heavy over Adil's successor, and the future of U.S.-Iraq relations was very much up in the air. The pandemic was just cresting over the horizon, and now here we are uh, about a year and a half later, and look at how things have changed. Mustafa al Qadami uh, leads a government charged with preparing for early elections. He's dealing with health and budget crises that couldn't have been foreseen uh, back then. We've held three rounds of the U.S.-Iraq strategic dialogue in order to breathe new life into our bilateral relationship under the strategic framework agreement. And we have, of course, a new administration in Washington. But through all of this, U.S. policy objectives have remained remarkably steady as of our core challenges which Bilal, I think, very uh, adroitly summarized here. The reality is that our relationship with Iraq is always going to be important in, in its own right, regardless of who's in power or what Iraq's neighbors seek to do or not to do. We continue to seek an Iraq that's stable, sovereign, prosperous, prosperous and democratic. That's not going to change. What that means is building up Iraq's institutions, and not, as Bilal said, trying to enter the horse race of who should be picked as prime minister or who should go to this ministry or that one. Those would be the actions of an occupying power, and that's not what we are. As I mentioned last year, endemic corruption, lack of judicial accountability, and these militia groups that Bilal described pose the largest obstacles to those efforts. Why? Why are they trying to distract everyone, as Bilal said, with these constant attacks and this propaganda about what these couple thousand U.S. soldiers are up to? Um, I mean, their work is pretty boring. They're there to fight ISIS uh, by supporting the Iraqi security forces to go after these guys. It's, it's pretty basic. What are we doing with the rest of our relationship is the real question. That's what the militias don't want you to hear about. That's what they don't want you to focus on because that's where we really threaten their vision for Iraq and their way of doing things. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that today. And I'm gonna be super boring because I'm gonna give you details that you probably aren't following and I hope will surprise you at least a little bit. Um, so 
we're very active in the area of stabilization. Uh, am I frozen, or is uh, Jane saying that uh, you're she's not fro frozen? You're not frozen. Okay. All right. I seem to be paranoid about that today. Thank you, David. Um, so anyway, stabilization. We're very active in helping rebuild the communities devastated uh, by the ISIS genocide. We're the largest donor to the UN Development Program's uh, funding facility in that regard. What does that mean? I could blah, blah, blah about the billions of dollars. What it means specifically is we've rehabilitated more than 130 schools with that funding, as well as 57 primary health care clinics, 62 water treatment plants, 17 electricity substations, and three hospitals. So what that means is if you're living, if you're an Iraqi living in an area that's been liberated from ISIS, which is like a third of the country, and you're drinking clean water, your kids are going to school, and you're, you've got electricity in your house, and you're uh, going to the uh, local health center when you need medical care, most likely you are going to a facility that has been uh, rehabilitated or you're using a facility that's been rehabilitated by US government funding. Uh, we're doing smaller things too. Uh, like when I was in Iraq in the spring, when I visited Baghdad and Arbil, uh, we announced assistance uh, after the Ibn Khatib hospital fire there. We're also investing in renovating and equipping 24 laboratory suites across the Iraqi government to help with COVID and other epidemi epidemiological challenges. We also have a very, very boring and wonky US aid program focused on governance and accountability. This, works, this program works with provincial governments and civil society to improve things like solid waste management, water supply, picking up the garbage, uh, bringing electricity. One tangible result of that work is that now the residents of Western Anbar, one of the driest regions in Iraq, have improved access to water supplies. That program has also helped the Iraqi government develop standard bidding procedures for more than 400 capital investment projects. I can't even tell you how many billions of dollars have gone through uh, this transparent bidding process. And these contracts were not subject to, to corruption. Now that's 400 out of many, many more, of course, but at least we're making progress. USAID has advisors sitting inside the Ministry of Finance, assisting with public financial management to make that institution stronger. Uh, we're doing other things too. We have a new development finance corporation that just decided to finance a quarter of a billion dollar expansion project for the Pearl Petroleum uh, Hormor gas field in the Kurdistan region. That project is expected to help reduce the region's blackouts and support the use of natural gas instead of dirty diesel and oil fired uh, generation, which will decrease the pollution in the atmosphere. On the education front, before COVID, we had more than 1,200 Iraqi students studying in the United States. We want them all back. We want to get more than, the, than that number uh, studying in America. We're helping to rebuild universities in Mosul, Tikrit, Fallujah, and Anbar that were destroyed by ISIS. Uh, you might ask, you know, why are we not doing that in uh, other areas of Iraq? Well, Iraq is not a poor country, as Bilal pointed out. Those parts of Iraq that were not destroyed by ISIS, the government ought to be able to, uh, to uh, improve the universities on their own. But for American style universities, uh, such as the American University of Iraq and Sulaymaniyah, uh, our Congress is giving grant money. They've appropriated another $10 million uh, for those higher education initiatives uh, for us to make those grants. Uh, we're also working closely with the Iraqi government, with the United Nations and our partners in Europe and around the world to fulfill the government's request for help in organizing and monitoring the elections. That's why we've contributed more than $10 million to UNAMI, uh, and that contribution and our lobbying have resulted in other nations contributing uh, $20 million more. Uh, we've also supported, of course, uh, the idea of having a UN monitoring team 
uh, in Iraq. And uh, so that's going to make a big difference, we hope, to people having confidence that their votes are going to be counted and they're going to matter. So uh, we're also talking at every chance that we can with uh, the Iraqi government uh, about their requirement, their uh, moral duty to protect peaceful protesters and civil society activists. Uh, July 6th, just last week, marked the one year anniversary of the assassination of Hisham al-Hashimi right in front of his house. We continue to call on the Iraqi government to bring those responsible for his murder to justice as well as those responsible for the killings of Ihab al-Wazni and the disappearance of and killing of hundreds of other protesters and civil society activists. We have no doubt that anti-democratic uh, armed militia groups are behind these cowardly acts and their targeting of human rights and democracy advocates has to end. And we're gonna bear witness uh, to this and we're gonna push the Iraqi government uh, to take on those militias um, until they do and bring them to justice. So we've got this strategic dialogue coming up uh, in, uh, in just a, a few short days. Um, these meetings are about expanding our bilateral relationship in all the areas I just talked about. But of course, you know, if the militias get their way, all of the media, all of the attention is gonna focus on that one or two sentences in the joint communique talking about our security uh, cooperation relationship. I say, don't fall into that trap. Focus on everything else that we're doing or should be doing uh, to grow this bilateral relationship, which is strategic in nature and which is valuable all on its own. As I said earlier, we've got a strategic framework agreement that both countries agreed to back in 2008 that sets out a great roadmap for how to do this. But the other day when I was on television and I said, you know, we're not at war with the militias. We want them to just leave us alone. I want them to leave us alone and leave Iraqi people alone so that we can get to this agenda. Because the more time we're spending on uh, dodging rocket attacks or having to defend ourselves, which we will do, uh, then the less time that we can devote to all of these other issues that are very, very important, like saving lives uh, from COVID. As you said, Bilal, we need to send vaccines. We are, we're the biggest donor through COVAX, but there's a lot of negotiating and a lot of logistics that need to take place in order for those to deliveries to happen. And the more we're sitting there uh, worrying about the next attack, uh, the less time we're gonna have to be working on those life-saving uh, initiatives. So the militias pose a potent challenge. They seek to perpetuate a parallel structure based on corruption and violence and we can't let them do that. Uh, we know that there are too many Iraqi nationalists who want to see a brighter future with a strong uh, bilateral strategic relationship with the United States, and that's what we're, we're going to work on together. Thanks, Joey. Uh, a lot of meat there. Um, all right, um, let's go on. Uh, Jean, are, are you out there? I am. I am. Can you? You can hear me, yeah? We can. Okay, I'm apologies again for all of this. I am, in fact, thrilled to be here. And Ambassador Hood, thank you for those lovely comments. If the internet were working then, you would have seen me blush. Um, this is such a great panel and such a great time. And part of the reason why you can't see me is I'm in a part of the country where things don't always go as planned, um, Nasria. I don't know if you can hear the party that's going on over my head. That is kind of a uniquely Iraqi thing, perhaps, Bilal, that we had a tragedy just yesterday, day before yesterday, and, and today there's a wedding. Um, but life goes on here. Uh, one thing I did want to start off with, just a little bit about Nasri and a little bit about the hospital fire, is um, 92 dead was declared by Iraqi state media. It, it turns out that's not correct. We found out today in talking to the new Iraqi provincial health director that it's actually 61. So while not as absolutely horrific a death toll, still of course an incredible tragedy. And, and like much in Iraq, one of those multi-layered tragedies. A tragedy because 
it was a shoddily built extension to a hospital, a tragedy because authorities were warned that there were problems, that there were oxygen leaks, that it should not have been built of those materials and no one listened. A tragedy because this was a coronavirus virus isolation ward filled with people's relatives because there wasn't enough nursing staff and you have to have a relative to bring you food. A tragedy because you have an entire population here, the young population, young people, who don't have that memory of Saddam. And when I talked to them today, said things were better under Saddam. And when I tried to them out on that, because these are 16, 17 year olds, they don't remember what it was like under Saddam Hussein. Some of them had relatives killed under Saddam Hussein. All they know is that now does absolutely nothing for them. And, you know, education, educa it's, it's shocking, absolutely shocking that Iraq is now close to the bottom of Middle East countries in terms of education, in terms of children graduating, in terms of children ever going to school. This pandemic has set Iraq back irreparably. The fact that we're talking about distance education and most people don't have electricity, much internet, extremely worrying. I used to be so optimistic about this country and there's still a part of me that's really optimistic. It's that part that sees the incredible potential, the incredible energy of people, the incredible bravery of young people who show up in Nasriya and Baghdad, even when security forces and militias are shooting at them. But it's really hard to sustain that optimism. And one thing I saw today and one thing I heard today that surprised me that I haven't heard before is so many Iraqis, young Iraqis, who are desperate to leave. I talked to one guy who had an airplane tattooed on his arm. He'd never been on a plane. He said he wants to go absolutely anywhere. A 10-year-old asked me if he could come back to Canada with me. And I said, asked why. And he said, because we're afraid the militias will shoot us. There were kids there that had bullet wounds, you know, actual kids, like 10, 11, 12 from the protests. And so why, why am I rambling on about this? I guess I'm rambling on because, I don't know, how did it get to this point? I think we cannot figure out how to solve any of this before figuring out how it got to this point. Thanks. Jean, I think you're breaking up. Ah, can you still hear me? No, I can't. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. Did, uh, yeah. So how, let's um, start off with that. How, how did it get to this point <clears throat> where we left off? Yep. Yeah. That's essentially it. I do not have huge amounts of wisdom about how to fix Iraq. Um, I'm, I'm still here like from the 90s because this country is extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. The people are extraordinary and the problems are so immense. And that is the absolute tragedy, the untapped potential that one wonders how even basic things will be fixed. Uh, just going back a bit to the Nasriya hospital fire. I went today to a new hospital that has been 10 years being built. The Turkish hospital had not been opened, which is why they were building all these shoddy coronavirus isolation wards. This was the first hospital built in the area since 1981. Um, and it's not just obviously the infrastructure that needs to be fixed. It is finding a way to restore Iraqis' belief in things that actually will help their, change their lives. There's so little faith now in elections. People don't believe that elections will do them any good. So little faith in, in leaders of all kinds, whether they're political leaders, religious leaders, tribal leaders. I feel Iraq is, you know, that cliche, Iraq is at a crossroads. It's always at a crossroads. It's true. Um, but this one feels different somehow. This one feels like we are on the verge of something truly, truly cataclysmic. 
Thank you. Uh, wow, um, that's, yeah, that's terrible, uh, Jane, thank you. Um, let me remind everybody, by the way, once again, if you have questions, you can go to the Q&A function on Zoom, or if you're if you are live streaming, go to Policy Forum at, at WashingtonInstitute.org. I'll, I'll let a few more questions come in, but it, if I might, I, I'd like to ask our, our panelists maybe a, a question each. <clears throat> uh, Bilal, to you first. Um, you talked about, um, you know, a, a more incremental approach, but a broader approach um, that you saw that the Trump administration had, that the Biden administration should take, <clears throat> and and the importance of, of integrating uh, Iraq into the region. You talked about in the paper, um, but but you just now a little bit earlier mentioned something about the importance for the United States uh, and the government of Iraq to deter the militias. And, um, you know, that's uh, sort of the heart of the question there. But um, I wonder if you if you'd expand on on how you would propose um, for the government of Iraq and the United States to do a better job on that. Um, for Joey, um, forgive me for putting you on the spot here, um, but um, what are the differences in the Biden administration approach to Iraq um, from the Trump administration approach? Um, I see a lot of continuity. Um, um, also, can we expect going forward maybe some GLOMAG sanctions against these people who are violating human rights and promoting corruption? Uh, corruption? And finally, um, I don't know if I, I missed it in your remarks, but um, I don't think you referred to the, the Hashid as a Iranian-backed Shiite militia. <laughs> Am I wrong? All right, and finally for, for, for Jane, um, uh, you talked, I think, uh, compellingly uh, about really the, uh, how disheartened um, Iraqis are um, losing hope, um, and you, in a way, losing, losing hope. Um, how do they see the demonstrations? Um, are they willing to, to go in greater numbers? Do you think that uh, they see this as the only path forward uh, be, as opposed to elections? Um, it, uh, is this something that Iraqis can get behind in a, in a mass way? Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll bow in there. So we'll start off with Bilal. Thank you. Sure, I mean, that is probably the biggest and the toughest question out there, uh, Dave but I'll give it a shot. Uh, one, I think the 30,000 you know, foot approach to that question is, here's a country, here's a Middle Eastern country um, where you have elections and there is one election scheduled for October and no one can tell you in advance who's gonna win and who's gonna lose and who the next prime minister is going to be or the president or the speaker of parliament. It's politics is competitive. And there is political freedom in the sense that people speak their minds and they protest and they, you know, curse the politicians. They throw shoes at them when they show up in burned hospitals. And uh, some of them go to jail and uh, at public fora or TV uh, programs, uh, people speak their minds. And yes, there are some who get assassinated for it. There are some who get jailed for it. But that genie is out of the lamp. And then there is the kind of political structure that while you have a lot of authoritarian parts, you have a lot of authoritarian leaders, but no one has the power to single-handedly turn Iraq back into an authoritarian state. But the result is not accountable democracy that delivers good governance. The result is chaos. So there are two trends here. One trend that says, Let's have better elections. Let's go back to the constitution. Let's empower the state. Let's amend the constitution and make sure that uh, you know the, the militias are not allowed to participate in elections in the same. I mean, the constitution actually says that. There are others who say let's you know reform the election uh, system. We went from uh, Iraq all being one constituency into being a provincial constituency, and now this time uh, Iraqis are experimenting with very local constituency. So you have that trend of let's have a better democracy. But then perhaps, uh, you know, worryingly so, and I'm of the age that does remember Saddam Hussein, others who say that the only solution to the corruption, to the militia problem, to the chaos 
is to have a strong man. And, you know, in the Iraqi lingo, uh, if you remember, that basically means a dictator. And they say, well, we want a benign dictator. And last time I checked history or the academic literature, we don't have a formula on how to come up with a benign dictator. Or even if you're lucky and you get a benign dictator, there is no formula to keep that dictator benign. And I'm not sure we have in the body politics here anyone that can guarantee to remain benign, uh, even if they start off as a benign dictator. So, you know, short of having supporting dictatorship in this country, then I think it's worth uh, nudging this competitive politics, which I, you know, shy from calling it a democracy, but this competitive politics toward the kind of politics that, that delivers. And today, the, the two main problems in this country are, yes, the problem of unruly militias who have no regard for the state, who um, actually feed off of the state weakness, and they use politics, they use the competitive politics that I was referring to earlier, by keeping the state weak, because they know that uh, a strong state could be a tiger, so they, they dare not uh, get off of the back of that tiger. Uh, so you have that dynamic, and then you have the second problem of, of corruption, you know, which, which you know, pay, patronage politics, mismanagement, all here is referred to as corruption. How, how can the militias be deterred? I don't think it's a question of capacity. I think it's, it's a question of political will. And that political will is perhaps so far absent because unlike the state that doesn't feel that it has a, a regional or an international supporter, the militias do. The state does not have an outside patron and it doesn't feel that it's strong enough to stand on its feet. While the militias do have a regional patron, they can get away with shooting a, you know, a rocket at the embassy. And if it hits, then it's an act of resistance. And if it misses, then you, know, you can look at your booklet of, of conspiracy theories of why it was, that was the case. The state cannot do that, and the state doesn't have that kind of protection. So the state leaders are afraid, literally, to take on the militias. How do you build the courage? Well, the way that they're used to building up that courage is to have some sort of an international support. And that's where people are disappointed in the United States, because that's where they expect the United States is going to come in, to protect the state. And if they were to pick up a fight with the militias, that this, the, you know, America will be there for them. I don't think we're there. I don't think the Trump administration was there. I don't think the Biden administration will be there. So then the Iraqis are reverting to the second option, which is public protest. Now, uh, obviously, as Joey mentioned, many of these uh, protesters and activists get killed, assassinated, tortured, their legs get broken, but they are relentless. Uh, Jane was referring to the Iraqi spirit, the resilience. And part of that you see in the everyday uh, activity of the Iraqi uh, activists. Uh, activists. The Iraqi activists are one of the few people who uh, write publicly in the Iraqi press, in the foreign press, without a pseudonym. Because if they have something to say, then they will say it to your face. And that comes at the cost. And Husham al-Hashimi paid the ultimate price for that. Many others did the same uh, as recently as um, uh, uh, as Ali, uh, who, uh, who was kidnapped for and, 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 and tortured. So it's a, it's a weird combination, in fact. There is a sense of hopelessness that this country can never stand on its feet and that the militias are making billions of dollars. Uh, the allocation uh, that the PMF, which is this big umbrella that many groups fall under, is actually larger in terms of percentage of the, of the national uh, budget than many of the defense budgets of European countries. It's more than 2% of the Iraqi budget. So you look at that and you look at how uh, enmeshed in the Iraqi um, state apparatus and the bureaucracy are, you get hopeless. And then you go to the street and then you go to the cafes and then you talk to the young entrepreneurs and the, the young activists and the reporters and you say, there is no force can withstand the zeal of these young uh, activists. These people who basically say, with or without US help, with or without the international community, this is our country and we're gonna regain it. So, uh, you know, if you wanna look at, it, look at Iraq emotionally, it depends on who was the last person you talked to, whether you feel depressed and hopeless or whether you feel uh, absolutely elated about the bright future that this country is headed toward. And I think that 
the reality is kind of a muddle through in between. And that's where I think um, there is still a role for the United States to play. Uh, and that is for Iraq not to be isolated, not to be isolated politically, not to be isolated economically. And in fact, for the average Iraqi citizen to see the benefits of being integrated in this international uh, uh, system, to feel that they're part of something uh, larger than just a conflict between the United States and Iran that's being played out on the Iraqi soil. Thanks, Bilal. Joey, a couple of tough questions for you. Yes, as always. Well, I have to say, David, that my, uh, I riffed off of my remarks a little bit, uh, so I don't know exactly what I said, uh, but it is written, Iranian-backed militias. Uh, and yes, we are not going to allow uh, the Iranians to try to wash their hands of this and get uh, plausible deniability by saying, well, you know, the Iraqis are just resisting um, neo-colonial occupation or whatever their language is. Um, and so we have nothing to do with it. Well, of course they do, even if they don't necessarily direct and order every single attack uh, in every place, they have uh, helped form these groups, they've financed them, they've uh, armed them, they've uh, trained them. So uh, they can't escape responsibility here. Uh, I do often uh, avoid saying uh, Shiite militias because, because that's the sort of sectarianism that they want you to engage in. And uh, even taking it off the hook, it still rings. Um, you know how this job goes. So, uh, so that's the sort of sectarianism that they want us to engage in. Uh, and, and in fact, even though most of the uh, most difficult and most dangerous groups uh, are dominated by uh, Shiite Muslims, uh, the fact of the matter is they're also supporting uh, groups that are uh, among the Yazidis, among the Christians, uh, among Sunnis, uh, they supported Al Qaeda uh, at one point. Uh, so, you know, this is, uh, we want to talk about Iranian backed groups and not necessarily what their sectarian nature is, because that's not what bothers us the most. Um, you also asked about uh, the differences between uh, this administration's approach and the last one. I would say deliberation is probably the biggest one, um, whereas, uh, Famously, in the last administration, the president could sometimes decide one thing one day and another thing another day, and the bureaucracy, as you remember, would rush to try to implement what he wanted to do. In this uh, administration, the interagency process is back, and so it can be slow, it can be uh, nail, it can be uh, just uh, mind-numbingly uh, boring sometimes, but what ends up happening is you arrive at decisions that have consensus and that are well thought out and, and uh, have a very strong legal basis when you're talking about things like uh, taking defensive measures against these groups and uh, their supporters and their infrastructure. Um, so this applies to sanctions policy as well. Uh, this is taking a long time uh, to look uh, very deliberately at all of the evidence. You know, people say, well, you know, so-and-so is corrupt or that one is corrupt. Sure, you may know something in your heart, but these sanctions, as you recall, David, have to hold up in a U.S. court of law, which is not an Iraqi court of law. <laughs> you need to be able to have evidence that can stand up to a judge who knows nothing about Iraq, nothing about you know the, the, the alphabet soup, as Bilal said, uh, and just looks at the facts that we can bring uh, in front of them. So that's, uh, that's another reason why that goes a, a bit a lot more slowly than anyone would like to see. Um, and my, I'd like to address quickly uh, something you, you asked Bill all about in terms of deterring the militias. Uh, you know, of course, it's not our role to deter them except deterring them from attacks against us. We will defend ourselves uh, through uh, proportional uh, responses in, a, in times and places of our choosing. But in terms of deterring the militias uh, more generally, that is the job of the Iraqi government, and we will do everything we can to give them the institutions that are capable of doing that. But it, it's a question of political will. You now have the uh, region's premier counterterrorism service capable of taking on the baddest bad guys of ISIS. 
if you don't define the militia activities as bad terrorist activity uh, and, and take them on, that's not something we can do for you. Um, but if you want that support, you've got it. And uh, the political backing, you'll have it from around the world. Um, but uh, what, what the militias want is that isolated Iraq, that weak Iraq that doesn't have friends, doesn't have, have that kind of support uh, so that they can just reap all the benefits of taking those ministries over and over. Because Bilal, you talked about how nobody knows how the elections will go and what the results will be. I can tell you that unless something changes radically, uh, it really doesn't matter which party has the Ministry of Electricity. It's not going to work because they don't view their job as providing electricity. They view their job as providing uh, patronage to their party. And as, until that changes, well, the electricity sector isn't going to change. That's for sure. Thanks, Joey. Um, Jean. Yeah, so... I mean, the power of the protest movement, the reason that it was able to achieve historic change, even though it didn't come close to the goals that most of the activists wanted, was that it was broad-based, that it brought in women, that you saw families, there were secular people. And that actually managed to move mountains. It was extraordinary. And then it was crushed. And it was crushed very deliberately and very effectively. And now what you have, I believe, are the remnants of a protest movement. And remnants being some of them, some of the people are in hiding. You know, they, their friends have been killed, assassinated on, on gunmen with, by gunmen with silencers on motorbikes. Most of them have been threatened. Some of them still actually are out there and they want their names out there, even though it's incredibly dangerous. Here in Nasria, um, there's protest as there is almost every night. So you see it in the streets, you see, but the things that they wanted and and the things that they hoped they would achieve did not materialize because we've seen over and over that the people who were shooting protesters, the militias, the security forces have not been brought to justice or if they have been brought to justice, very few, it hasn't been made public. And now that's had a real effect on, on activists who are willing to participate in the elections the number of activists who are able or willing to register for elections is really low. And part of that, of course, is that bar that's there in terms of the money you need, in terms of the support you need. I did meet with one activist today here in Nasria who is trying to launch a nationwide party because he says they're intent on bringing the protest movement from the squares to parliament. And isn't that a wonderful thought? But right now it seems a bit far-fetched. Thanks, Jane. Um, listen, we'll go a couple minutes over here. I want to ask, um, we have a handful of questions out there. Um, first one is, um, what is the U.S. doing to help candidates sent by demonstrators in, in the, for the October elections? Uh, the Iranians and the Iraqi militias are already helping their people. Are we doing anything? That's probably either for Joey or, or Bill. Right. Uh, what a kiss of death that would be. Uh, you know, the, the third party here um, uh, bringing in its puppets to, uh, to extend the occupation. I could just see the propaganda lines now. No, uh, what the United States needs to be doing, and we are doing, is answering the Iraqi government's request for assistance to help make sure that the uh, election is uh, monitored by uh, international actors, that they have the training and the uh, and the support, the financial support that they need to actually organize um, elections that have a chance of being free and fair. Uh, and frankly, we need to be forthright as well, uh, as I've tried to be, that if we, through that monitoring, see that this election was largely fraudulent, we're going to say it. And we're going to say that the, re the government resulting from it um, is maybe not a legitimate one, if that's what we see. We're not going to be shy about it. Uh, you know, gone are the days when we're picking and choosing who's going to run what in Iraq. 
Um, as Jane said, we're at a cataclysmic uh, moment in this country. And so we can't be uh, pussyfooting around the truth. Thanks for that. And, and another, and, and this is a standard question that I asked um, often when I was in the government. Um, why don't the Iraqis know about everything we've done, Joey? You just gave a long list there. I've, uh, I went to Iraq 12, 13 times when I was in government, talked about it all the time. Iraqis don't know any of this stuff. Why don't they know anything? Well, I think we face uh, a uh, difficult information environment all around the world. I mean, even here in the United States, we developed a uh, fantastic vaccine against uh, COVID-19. There's no reason that any American should be dying right now of COVID-19. Vaccines are available at any CVS down on the corner. Uh, people can get vaccinated uh, for free anywhere they want. And yet we have uh, roughly 30 more percent of the population in some areas that just won't do it because they believe this or that sort of uh, disinformation about the vaccines. So you have the same problem in Iraq where you have all of these militia groups. You have the Iranian government, you have the Russians, you have uh, the People's Republic of China, you have all sorts of other actors who don't want the truth about the US uh, strategic relationship to come out. And then you've got all the baggage of our uh, past with Iraq that I think also dissuade some people from believing what they might hear from you or from me or from others about what's really going on. Um, and so I think all of that factors into it. And the fact that we're a government, we're not uh, really adept at, uh, you know, getting our messages out there in new and innovative ways. Um, we're a boring bureaucracy. So we do our best with the tools that we've got. Um, but I think what speaks loudest is uh, the results. And so those hospitals and those uh, schools that I talked about, the people who go there know who provided them. And so the more we do that, I think the more hearts and minds we change. Well, Joe, this is a question for everybody here on the panel, but um, I think, um, you know, why should we have, um, and this is uh, one of the ones that was, was sent in, uh, why should we have a strategic relationship with Iraq? Um, would the money be better spent and in Mexico, you know, improving those societies so we don't have problems on the border and Ethiopia and Nigeria. I mean, why, why, why Iraq? Um, and this is for Ball to make that argument as well. Uh, and uh, Jane, if you want to weigh in on that. Well, I'll go very quickly and just say that these are arguments that we have to make to Congress every year, uh, as well as within our own interagency before we even put together the budget request to go to Congress. So. Uh, these are questions that we deal with uh, very actively. Um, but look, you know, I think we've talked about it in, in different parts of this uh, event. Iraq has over 40 million people. That's not insignificant. It's one of the world's top oil producers. That's not insignificant. Uh, we purchase um, almost half a billion dollars worth of that oil uh, every month at current oil prices. Um, it's got an amazing diversity that you don't find in most places uh, around the Middle East or around the world now. And they've got a heritage that, as Pope Francis pointed out during his visit, is a global heritage. It doesn't belong just to Iraqis or to Arabs or to people from the Middle East. You know, if you're a, a believer in any of the three Abrahamic religions, Iraq's heritage is your heritage. So there's a lot of reasons why this country uh, remains strategic not just because of its geography, but because of all these other region, uh, all these other reasons, and it's well worth uh, our investment. I think. Thanks, Bilal. Uh, I'd quickly add, as I say in the report, that um, Iraq is too big and too rich a country to be in the wrong hands. Uh, when Iraq is in the wrong hands, when it's it's mismanaged either by dictatorship or by sectarian sectarianism then uh, it really causes trouble, not only for the Iraqi people, but for the region. Iraq is a country that once invaded Kuwait when it was under um, dictatorship. It gassed its people. Um, one of the survivors of Saddam Hussein is gassing. And uh, fought an eight year war with, with Iran that killed a million from both sides. A chaotic 
an accountable governance in Iraq, not a dictatorship, not a single party dictatorship, but this uh, experience of 2005, since 2003, the toppling of Saddam Hussein regime, has also been a source of instability, not only for the Iraqi people with sectarian war, with car bombs, with Al Qaeda's terrorism, but also a threat to the entire region with ISIS, when occupied a third of the country, including oil fields that made it the wealthiest terrorist uh, group in human history. Uh, and that terrorist group posed threats not only to the Iraqi people, but all the way to Europe and to the United States. And then today, the unruly militias, yes, they are killing more Iraqis and they're killing other people, but they're also posing a challenge to uh, Iraq's neighbors. So an Iraq that's not stable, that's not well governed, will become, or I described this Chernobyl that emits instability throughout the region. And I think that that's not something that the United States or the international community uh, should ignore. Thank you, Jane. Can you comment on this? Are you still out there? I don't think so. Listen, we have a, a number of other questions. I want to be conscious of, um, of Joey Hood's time and uh, everybody else's time. Um, and I think most of the other questions have been, been touched on. The, the last thing I'll ask, just to wrap up, um, which was asked in the, in the queue here, was about um, the centrality of, uh, of human rights. We've heard a lot about how important human rights is uh, for the, the Biden administration, um, central, as uh, uh, Secretary Blinken said, in, in the relationship with Egypt, uh, the reset because of human rights with Saudi Arabia. Um, where do they play in the, uh, in the relationship, bilateral relationship with, uh, with Iraq and where should they play? Well, I think when you get right down to it, uh, human rights is the foundation of our uh, approach. Whether you're fighting ISIS because you wanna help uh, people avoid genocide, you wanna help people recover from that attempted genocide, uh, you wanna prevent uh, those things from happening again, that's why you're fighting ISIS. Um, when we're trying to reconnect Iraq to the rest of the world, uh, when we're trying to invest in uh, the universities, as I talked about, um, I didn't even talk about our journalism uh, training programs that we have going on. Why? So that journalists can report the truth, uh, whether the militias or uh, party leaders like it or not, or the government leaders, whether they like it or not, because that's your best bet against uh, corruption. And that's your best bet for accountability uh, for all the things that we've been talking about. So human rights is very much at the center of our approach in Iraq, uh, and it's the center of all of our discussions with uh, the Iraqi government. We think we have a prime minister in Mustafa al Kadhimi who uh, truly values human rights, and that's true of uh, the president of the republic and the speaker of the parliament as well. And so um, as long as we have leaders like this, we feel that there's at least a ray of hope uh, that we can work with this government to improve uh, everyone's human rights. Thanks, Joey Bilal. Um, actually, uh, despite the pronouncements of both the, uh, you know, the, the literature of the United States government, this is one area that uh, Iraqis feel really let down. Um, they feel that not only the US response, but the international response to killing some 800, 600 to 800 protesters was, was rather muted. Uh, the international community is rather muted to the systematic campaign of assassinations against the protesters. Yes, it's important to have um, credible elections and have monitors on election day, and I'm very pleased to hear uh, Joey say that if the elections are not, do not meet uh, the international standards that the US government, uh, which has the leadership position in this, will take the lead on not recognizing the election and perhaps even questioning the legitimacy of the government that emerges from it. That's actually, uh, as I said, I'm very happy to hear this. It's one of my key recommendations in this report because it's not about what happens on election day, it's about the months that lead up to the elections. 
many of the candidates, as, as we heard from, uh, from uh, Jane earlier, uh, they not only not have the money to run a campaign, they dare not go out and campaign because they might get assassinated. And this new election law might actually has narrowed down the field so much that uh, they know who is a serious threat and therefore needs to be killed. And, you know, who can they choose to, uh, to let alone? So the, the youth movement here, the protest movement here, which by the way, according to the Arab Youth Survey, has 82% uh, of Iraqi youth support the protest movement. Some 85 plus percent of them believe that that's the only way to make changes, but they feel let down uh, by the international community. They feel that what contributes to the um, unaccountability and the chutzpah of these militias is not only Iran's support, but also the silence of the international community on human rights. So the pronouncements, the attention is definitely welcome. But I think the size of human rights abuse in this country, not only the protest movement, but ongoing on the minorities, ongoing on um, um, the camps, but also not in terms of just targeted human rights abuses, but I think power cuts in 111 degree Baghdad is a human rights abuse. That kind of, uh, uh, buying gas four times the price of, uh, of market prices is a form of human rights abuse. Uh, corruption that is so predatory uh, is a form of human rights abuse in this country. So I think expanding the meaning of human rights abuse, that's definitely how, how the Iraqis uh, see it. I think in, in terms of injecting accountability to this otherwise unaccountable system, uh, what the international community can do is go after those who launder Iraqi money, those who commit assassinations in this country and then they run away to, uh, to other countries. So I think on those two terms, uh, the international, the United States can take a leading role in bringing to justice those perpetrators of either corruption and siphoning of billions of dollars or those who find refuge in uh, countries around the world after they commit um, uh, violent crimes in this country. Thanks, Bilal. Um, all right, the last word for, for Jane Aroff, if she's still out there. I know it's spotty coverage in Nasriya. All right. Um, with that, uh, I'd like to, um, to thank Joey, Jane, Bilal, um, and, um, and everybody who showed up. I'm sorry I didn't get to all the questions, but I think this is really a, a fascinating discussion, and I appreciate um, your time and uh, recommend that everybody read your transition paper on um, accountability in and, uh, and Iraq so, um, and corruption. Uh, so thank you very much from the Washington Institute, and we'll see you again soon.